From the early days in the crib as a chemist, you learn how to generate molecular orbitals for a simple system like H2. Each side of the MO diagram has a 1s orbital. They combine to form a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital. This is an approximation called linear combination of atomic orbitals, or LCAO. Often, this is used to find the MOs for a system. The procedure gets a little more complicated when you have to move to polyatomic systems. However, chemists still use LCAO to find the molecular orbitals and discuss electronic structure. To do this, we need a procedure for placing a group of orbitals from different atoms on one side of the diagram that retains the symmetry of the system. We call these groups of orbitals symmetry adapted linear combinations of atomic orbitals, or SALC AOs, or just SALCs. This allows us to put multiple atoms on one or both sides of the diagram and combine them to get the MOs. In other words, we assume that we can understand the electronic structure of polyatomic molecules as a combination of the constituent atomic orbitals, and those orbitals combine under the symmetry of the molecule. Here, we will discuss representations in molecular orbital theory under this LCAO method. In many systems, but not all, we have a central atom that resides on the point where all the symmetry operations meet. We will use this central atom to discuss irreducible representations in group theory and what they mean when applied to molecular orbital theory. In this video, we will assume some familiarity with group theory. Really, all you'll need is what is in our previous video on the topic, finding symmetry operations and assigning point groups. As you probably already guessed, you'll need some familiarity with atomic orbitals and molecular orbital theory. We divide the problem of drawing MOs for polyatomic systems where there is a central atom into two parts, finding the irreducible representations corresponding to the valence orbitals of the central atom, and finding the representations for the orbitals of everything else. If you have a system with a central atom, then that central atom will sit on the point that all your symmetry operations go through. For example, bromine pentafluoride is C4V with C4 axes, a C2, two sigma Ds, and two sigma v planes, and all those symmetry operations go through the bromine. Using our BRF5 example, we will write out the molecule with appropriate axes. As discussed in the group theory video, the principal rotation axis is almost always the highest order rotation axis, which we'll call z. In this case, the z axis will be along the axial FBR bond of the square pyramidal structure. We'll put the x and the y axes along the BRF bonds in the equatorial plane. Bromine is a central atom that sits where all the symmetry operations meet. We will make the bromine one side of our MO diagram. Here we'll discuss how to find the irreducible reps for the bromine central atom, what an irreducible rep is, and how they are generally labeled. In other parts to the series, we'll talk about generation of salcs for the left side, including orthogonalization of degenerate salcs formation of MOs, and interpretation of MOs to understand properties and reactivity. Here is the C4V character table. In the left column, the symbols like A1, E, and B2 are the Mulliken symbols for the irreducible representations. So what's an irreducible representation? It's a mathematical construct that stands in for an element in the group theory problem you're trying to solve. In other words, it depends on the problem. For MO theory, the irreducible representations stand in for orbitals, either atomic orbitals or salcs. A couple of things about irreducible reps. All character tables are square matrices. There are just as many irreducible reps along the left side as there are classes across the top. Irreducible reps can have different numbers of dimensions, things they represent. For three-dimensional objects, the irreducible reps will generally be 1, 2, or 3D. How many dimensions the irreducible rep is can be found under identity. So in C4V, A1, A2, B1, and B2 are all one dimensional. The E irreducible rep at the bottom left in the character table is two dimensional. The irreducible representations are orthogonal to one another. Mathematically, that means for two irreducible representations I and J, summed across all classes R, the number of operations in the class, g, times the character, which is usually given the symbol chi in the ith variable, times the character of the jth rep, is equal to zero. First, what is g? It's the number of operations in the class, so the coefficient for the class. We will often use the Greek letter chi for a character. 
the equation has chi i r and chi j r. Let's assume we're going to show that a1 and b2 are orthogonal. Chi a1 e equals 1 and chi b2 e equals 1. Under c4 z, the character for 1 is a1 and it's negative 1 for b2. Here's the full equation where i equals a1 and j equals b2. This is an important property as we're going to use irreducible representations as stand-ins for orbitals. In other words, orbitals in different irreducible representations necessarily have zero overlap. The Mulliken symbols are a shorthand description of the irreducible representation named after Robert Mulliken, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1966 for the development of molecular orbital theory. Here, he is third from the right in the back with other notable scientists, including Ver Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, and Frederick Hund. Mulliken's MO theory was, and is, incredibly influential in chemistry and all but replaced valence bond theory by Lewis, Pauling, Coulson, and others. There is a bit of a resurgence in what I'll call hybridization theories, which we can hopefully discuss in other videos. Mulliken symbols are assigned using a few rules. The dimensionality of the irreducible representation is given by the main symbol capital A, B, E, or T. A is for a single dimensional representation and symmetric with respect to the principal rotation axis. B is also for a single dimensional representation and anti-symmetric with respect to the principal rotation axis. E is for two dimensional representations and T is for three dimensional representations. A subscript one or two means that the representation is symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to perpendicular C2 axes or if lacking this with respect to sigma V. Primes or double primes are used to indicate that the representation is symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to sigma H. If the molecule has an inversion center, G, Gerata, and U, Ungerata, are used to designate that the representation is symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to inversion. So looking at the simple C4V character table, we can look down the column under the identity operation, E. There are four different irreducible reps with plus one and one with plus two, the dimensionality of the rep is always given under identity. Under E will be how many things are in the representation. To decide which of the one dimensional representation are A's and which are B's, we look at the principal rotation axis, in this case C4. If the representation is symmetric with respect to the principal rotation axis, there is a plus one and is given an A. If it is anti-symmetric with a negative one, it is given a B. There is one 2D representation, so it is given E. Since there is only one 2D rep, we don't need to put anything except E to make it unique. So now we have two A reps and two B reps, and we want a different name for all of them. So we go to two on the list, which says that A subscript one or two means that the representation is symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to the perpendicular C2 axis, or if lacking this, with respect to sigma V. Our point group is C4V, so there are no perpendicular C2 axes. Looking at sigma V, we get the representations with a plus one under this operation as subscript one, and the ones with a negative one, a subscript two. Now all our labels are unique, so we can stop. If the atom you're looking at resides at the central point where all the operations meet, like BR in our example, you can look to the right of the irreducible representations to see the symmetries of those orbitals. The p orbitals have the same symmetry as linear functions, namely they are similar to vectors along the axis directions with a positive and negative phase. The d orbitals are quadratic functions and the f orbitals are cubic. The first irreducible representation has all ones across the different classes and is called the totally symmetric irreducible representation. The s orbital always has the symmetry of this rep. Scanning down the column of linear functions, you see that the z vector is in the a1 rep. Essentially what a plus one in the class will mean is that the orbital is unchanging when that operation is applied. If there's a negative one, the phases swap. If you look at what happens when you do a c4, c2 along z, sigma v, and sigma d on the pz orbital, 
the phase doesn't change and the orbital is unmoved. So plus one is given across all of these classes and PZ is in the A1. The same will obviously be true for the spherical S orbital. An S orbital will never change with any operation and will always be in the totally symmetric rep at the top. The other P orbitals, PX and PY, are in the 2D representation E, which means they are degenerate, and there is some symmetry operation that converts the two. Let's draw these two orbitals in the XY plane and see what happens to them as we do the symmetry operations. The identity operation leaves them the same. Again, if no phase change occurs and the orbital doesn't move, we give it a plus one. We have two orbitals in the set and neither moves, so plus one for each for a plus two under the E operation. There are two C4s. For any functions, operations in the same class will do the same thing to the functions. In other words, it doesn't matter if we look at the C14 or the C34 along the z-axis. During this operation, both functions move into the other, px moves into py, and vice versa. When this happens, we give those functions a zero. The next operation is C2, which leaves the p orbitals where they are, but inverts the phases. Because of the phase change, we give each orbital negative one, so negative two overall. The sigma v operations are along the x and y axes. The character will be the same regardless of which plane of symmetry we look at, so let's do the one along x. The orbitals along the mirror plane doesn't move, but the py inverts its phase. So one orbital gives a plus one and the other minus one for overall zero. The sigma d operations are between the axes, interconverting the orbitals. Since the orbitals move, the character is also zero. For the central atom, we have looked at the irreducible representations that correspond to the valence orbitals on bromine, which look like this. For every main group element like bromine, we only have one s orbital and three p orbitals in the valence set. There was a time when chemists proposed that the heavier main group elements could access d orbitals, but scientists working in the field threw that idea out in the 80s with parachute pants, mullets, and leg warmers. Any of those things are more likely to make a comeback than d orbitals in the main group bonding. Why are the symmetry labels for the orbitals useful? Since the irreducible representations and the orbitals they represent are orthogonal, in order to overlap, two orbitals have to be in the same irreducible representation. Two orbitals being the same irreducible rep is necessary but not sufficient to show overlap. In other words, if two orbitals are in different irreducible representations, their overlap is precisely zero. If two orbitals are in the same irreducible representation, they could still have zero overlap, but it might be non-zero. For example, take two atomic orbitals, P, Z, and S, on the bromine. They're both A1, but all orbitals on the same atom are orthogonal, with zero net overlap. The amount of constructive and destructive interference exactly cancels. Even orbitals in the same irreducible rep and on different atoms may have no significant overlap, perhaps due to being too far away. Let's quickly look at a couple of transition metal examples and assign the valence orbitals to irreducible reps. Here is nickel tetracarbonyl. If you go through our point group assignment flowchart, the compound is not linear. It's not in a low symmetry group. It has a C3 axis. In fact, it has multiple C3 axes that are not coincident. So we're in a high symmetry T group. The mirror planes contain the C3, so it is in the TD group. The TD character table looks like this. In the valence shell for a transition metal like nickel, we have 1s, 3p, and 5d orbitals. The 1s orbital is always in the totally symmetric rep, A1 in this case. Looking down the column at the linear functions, you find that x, y, and z are all in the same irreducible rep, T2. So px, py, and pz are degenerate in TD. For the d orbitals, we look down the quadratic functions. The orbital we usually call dz squared is actually 2dz squared minus x squared minus y squared, which appears in the E irreducible rep as a degenerate orbital with dx squared minus y squared. The other three d orbitals, dxy, dxe, and dyz, are together as a set under T2. We have managed to assign all nine valence orbitals for a central nickel in a TD system. As one last example, let's look at cobalt hexachloride 3 which we found had octahedral symmetry in a previous video. 
Here, we can assign all the valence orbitals from cobalt by looking at the linear and quadratic functions, which gives us this. Notice what happens on going from Td to OH for the transition metal. The S and D orbitals went from A1, E, and T2 to A1, G, E, G, and T2, G. All we did was add a G to the irreducible reps. This was because OH and Td are both cubic groups. We make them from inscriptions of a cube. The D orbitals are garata with a center of inversion, and when we went to OH, which has an inversion center, the irreducible reps took account of this. On the other hand, P orbitals are ungarata. Their phase changes on inversion. So we add a U to the label going from TD to OH. In this video, we try to give you an idea of what a representation is, at least in the context of MO theory. And we found the valence orbital symmetries for a central atom. In part two, we will discuss how to form symmetry adapted linear combinations to overlap with the valence orbitals on the central atom. If you enjoyed this video and want to support future videos covering topics like this one, please subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. We make these videos for fun and as a way of interacting with and giving back to the community, so we greatly appreciate your support.